We made USAA insurance for veterans like James. When he found out how much USAA was helping members save, he said, It's time to switch. We'll help you find the right coverage at the right price. USAA. What you're made of, we're made for. Restrictions apply. Israel is 5,690 miles away from the U.S., 11 hours by plane. Hate travels faster. In a comment, in a post, in a second. Jewish hate is up 388% in the U.S. Black hate, Muslim hate, and Asian hate are up too. When one hate rises, they all do. Let's stand up to all hate together. Share and wear the blue square from StandUpToJewishHate.org. from the back of Ruth the Realtor's car, it's The Stacking Deed Show. I'm Ruth the Realtor's part-time mechanic, neighbor Doug, broadcasting live from the trunk of her 1988 Lincoln Town Car. On today's show, how do you unstuck a negotiation? We'll help you do just that with researcher and motivational speaker, Michael McQueen. Before that, in our headline, let's dive into the legal realm of lawsuits in the landlord-tenant dynamic. When is it time to sue a tenant, and when could you be open to a lawsuit? Plus, we'll answer a question from a dealer who wants to know how to break the ice on purchasing a neighbor's home. And because of popular demand, I'll wow you with my property pop quiz. And now, two peeps who have mastered the labyrinth of money thanks to Ruth's GPS, Crystal Hammond and Joe Saul Sihai. Hello. Does anyone dance when Doug says Joe's name? I you do. dance? Wow. Joe hey. Saul. See All right. <laughs> you do the overbite? We get down. Oh. <laughs> no. Is there you see these guys dancing. I know. This, yeah, stop dancing. Please stop dancing. <laughs> I'm glad we're audio. So glad we're audio. Welcome to the Stacky Deeds yes. Dance Off, everybody. Welcome. Yes, we bring it in, Crystal, to the end of the year. 2023 is it's almost in the year. It's 2023? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Doug's still writing 2011 on his checks. <laughs> Doug's the one person here who writes checks. Exactly. At the grocery store, uh, when you're in a hurry. That's 33 the person people you're, behind you're me. Behind. Well, Doug has trouble too because he's trying to navigate listening to his disc man while he's <laughs> and coupons <laughs> navigating the coupons too. You know, if you're writing the check, you have at least everybody coupons, makes fun of disc man. Like, oh, remember you'd walk around and those things would skip like crazy. I know that's where you were going with that, Joe. I had a disc man in 1992. It was a Sony, but I got it in England. Guy. Couldn't find it anywhere else. I lived there for a little while. Oh. You couldn't make this thing skip. And it got stolen, but it's still a piece of tech that I wished I had. It had oh. all this stuff on it that I didn't see in, like, you know, deck-based CD players. It was incredible. I only owned it for, like, six months. But it was possible. Don't and you had a disc man that didn't skip. And you make fun of me for owning a Zune. <laughs> Oh, wow. A Zoom. And yet he's Jeez. defending the disc man. I could picture neighbor Doug trying to do backflips, trying to make yeah. it skip, too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then throwing his back out, right? <laughs> Hey, Crystal, we got a great show today. Michael McQueen, yes. man, he's been on some of the biggest stages with names like Mel Robbins, Daniel Pink. He has definitely brought it to some of the biggest companies on earth, but he's oh, yeah. wandered Texarkana. We're going to pick him up. <laughs> <laughs> Deloitte for the government people. We all know who Deloitte is. He's been on some really big stages. Big stages. He's going to teach us the art of negotiation. We talked to Dia Bondi about how to ask, and now we're going to mm -hmm. finish that. Dia Bondi on a couple couple episodes ago and now michael mcqueen gonna help us get unstuck so mind we've stuck. got that on mind stuck well mind help, stuck. we're gonna help others get on mind stuck this always brings me back to friday when chris sucker was like i got mind control over depot so this is helping us <laughs> get mind control <laughs> over the contractors and the sellers so we can get our prices and our negotiations <laughs> just like all the lessons we learned in friday yeah. sounds like yes. a total mind yeah. that was over yes. on stacking yeah. benjamins we did a show about that we did our top yeah. 
movies and that was one of my top movie lessons yeah don't uh, mess yeah. with the drug dealer i think was the lesson in that movie. he Crystal. lost in the end well not to spoil it for anyone that has oh seen thanks Friday. Yes, Sorry. movie that came out in what 1992 or something. Yeah, but, the yeah. same year that Doug was doing backflips, trying to get his <laughs> Walkman to skip. And I couldn't. It was that good. I couldn't make it skip. Couldn't get the disc man unstuck. No skipping. Michael McQueen <laughs> gonna join us in a minute, but first we've got a headline. So let's go. Our headline is from liveabout.com. You know, Michael McQueen has that awesome Australian accent. That yes. sounds like you could say it with a Australian accent. Liveabout.com. It wouldn't be it's like walkabout. I'm British. I'm walk British. British. <laughs> and ever, there goes the UK audience right there. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> The one thing we don't want to do is get into a situation, Crystal, where we have to sue our tenant. Obviously, you want to stay on good terms with your tenant. I kind of like what our pal Alan Corey says. You know, you want to be friends, but you don't want to be buddies because right. sometimes then people will start taking advantage of that. But Too comfortable. Yep. Have you ever taken a tenant to court? No, I have not. I have not. Thank you. Either. Yes. Thankfully. Yeah, in my eight years. I know, 2005, a, whatever that, yeah, 23 minus five, that many years. Eight, that many. Eight, she doesn't have enough fingers to get 18? that math on, Doug. <laughs> 18 years. <laughs> She's like, uh-oh, I got to go to the toes to do that math. In my 18 years. This piece is 12 reasons you can sue your tenant. The obvious one is unpaid rent, right? If you're yeah. just not getting the rent, you send them a notice first to pay. And if that doesn't work, you can file to evict the tenant. At the same time, you can also sue them for any rent that they owe. You know, one thing that you got to mitigate here is if there's any way, this is a great reason to have Michael joining us today, Crystal, is that there's going to be costs associated with taking somebody to court. Yeah. Yep. So this is clearly a last ditch thing. Oh yeah. If you can get anything a lot of times, but then of course you're going to consult with your attorney because they do say, even if you accept a partial payment, you're starting to clock all over again where, yep. yep. You're letting them stay. Number two, unpaid utility bills. If there's any outstanding utility bills at the rental property in the tenant's name, you can sue them to recover that money. By the way, that often happens at the end of a lease. Yeah. At the end of a lease, people will just let everything go when they move. Now, you can deduct that from the security deposit. If that's not enough, then you can sue in small claims court to recover the rest. And remember Num to put that in your lease, too, of who pays what utilities, because that's also important, too. It's super important. Number three, damage to the property. Well, can we go back before we do that? I love that you said mm -hmm. that, Crystal. I have known several people that are landlords that just pull out a rando lease agreement off the internet. Oh. Mm -mm. Don't even really read the fine print of their own lease agreement. <laughs> you don't want to do that. No, that will cost you. That will cost you. Spending money on an attorney to do that, even though it is a boilerplate form, is so important because you can say, can we include this? Can we include this? And these are some key things to include. Number three, damage to the property. You can sue the tenant if the tenant's caused damage to the property. Again, you can start by deducting it from the security deposit, but if they don't cover the amount of damage done, you can take the tenant to court. I almost had to do this once. Oh. I had a tenant that had a dog. She was a school teacher. She seemed like such a nice lady. And when she moved out she was just a pig oh like, i could not believe the stuff that was stuck to the hardwood floors crystal that oh hardwood oh and i don't know what we were cleaning up gross gross stuff on the hardwood floors yeah See, it, that's why a lot of people have the no pets policy and then a lot of people lie about having pets well that was the other thing she was our first tenant and okay. she was so nice she said oh man i have this little dog and so i added like 150 dollars a month to her rent oh, and said, yeah, okay. you can do it. Well, here's the thing. I had to redo all the floors, all the hardwood floors, because that dog with his nails oh, just yeah. wrecked my hardwood floors. Thanks. Number four on this list is unapproved alterations to the unit. <laughs> I have not had this happen where a tenant just decided to randomly take down a wall. <laughs> How did they even get like occupancy? Like I'm amazed the permit department didn't come in on that. But even smaller things, if you paint the walls blue, you got to turn them back to the regular color. That should be in the lease too. I did have one tenant who did landscapes for a living. 
Oh. And he called me and asked me, he goes, hey, I know I was a week late on my rent a couple times and I didn't charge him extra. He <laughs> called me and I didn't charge him extra. He goes, can I make it up to you by landscaping the backyard? Oh, yes. Heck yeah. Oh, man, Do sweat it, equity. Mike. I know. Yeah. He took this rental unit made the backyard better and then when he moved out the next tenant was like oh the backyard's so beautiful yeah. <laughs> you know why because i'm a genius <laughs> <laughs> number five tenant owes more than the security deposit amount of course that's Ooh, an obvious one yep. counter sue of course the tenant can sue you if they believe you wrongly withheld their security but you got to watch out with that security deposit thing yes. crystal because how often have we seen landlords get in trouble with this withhold the security deposit next thing you know tenants taking them to court yeah, or at least on the phone, going, "What the hell are you doing? Keeping my security deposit?" Oh yeah, people's court covers this all the time. You need <laughs> receipts <laughs> for what you do if you're going to withhold the rent. You need receipts, and a lot of times, if you do work yourself, you can't get compensated for that. So just hire somebody and get those Hold on, receipts. People's court. This is where accounting and yeah. photos and receipts That's are still your a friend. thing. <laughs> oh yes, Judge Marilyn Million. She's still kicking. What are you doing watching TV rope. at one in the afternoon, Crystal? <laughs> <laughs> uh, lunch time you should always have lunch away from your desk <laughs> number eight we talked about never eat alone on this show See? there you go yeah eat with judge what's her name marilyn yeah. Mullion. yeah she will keep you entertained there it is to recover lost rent from an illegal move out if the tenant moved out before the lease was actually up you can take them to court to recover the rent they own for the remaining time of their lease that often crystal i've seen people go down that rabbit hole and that mm -hmm. usually still ends nowhere good i mean that's kind of a last ditch effort but you may be throwing money away trying to chase a tenant down to get paid for something that's so difficult yeah and then also remember like if you find someone you can't sue them still for the lease you can only sue for when it's empty too because people don't realize that these are reason before we go on to keep good tenant negotiations yes because in some of these or tenant relations rather but because in a lot of these crystal you seriously don't have as much it's like the emperor really has no clothes you know what I mean? <laughs> like if somebody moves oh. out mid-lease you could sue them like you do have some recourse but man just making sure they don't do that or if they do yeah. that that they call you and you can maybe work out a solution like anytime right. you can stay away from court yes be approachable be nice and then i'm noticing too a theme here the lease can protect you from a lot of this stuff too oh, it's like point. and then when you hire a professional that professional is going to tell you hey what did i miss you know they'll be able to see things that come up because sometimes when you're a new landlord you're learning on the fly and you're like crap that should have been in the lease you're learning the hard way of what things you should have been looking out for. So speak to somebody that's been there, done that. Speaking of weird things that should probably be in the lease, ex <laughs> expenses to dispose of tenants' abandoned property. Yep. If the tenant leaves and doesn't take some stuff with them and it's a pain in the ass to get rid of it, maybe a huge TV, a fish tank. One of those water beds. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have one of those Me water too. beds. <laughs> the slosh slosh around bed. Yep. You try to get that one air bubble out. Yeah. It just yeah. nope. It's so trouble. Annoying. But on a winter's day in the northern hemisphere, those things were amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's fantastic. Number ten, tenant use the property for illegal dealings. I think that's where uh. you really do want to sue because you want to just give a signal that I'm not going to put up with that. Oh, yeah. Like, this is not. And get the police involved, too, if you have to. Quickly, yeah. yes. No if you plans. illegally have a pet, we talked about that. That's one. People will try to run by you if there's no pets. We'll try to sneak one in there. And number 12, other breaches to the lease agreement. So there are two things that are protecting you here, too. Your lease and your insurance. Because what if they had a meth lab? Like, you want to make sure that you're insured for, you know, anything that could happen. Even the remote removal of you know that stuff because it's not like you can go in there yourself what? and remove that stuff wouldn't it be smarter to just put a clause in the lease to get part of the profits <laughs> from the meth lab <laughs> <laughs> seems like that just makes everybody happy uh... <laughs> if you no. have a meth lab we get a cut <laughs> 20%. Well, you just cover, I mean, even more broadly, I just, you know, any side businesses, any side hustles. Mm. It's like that. Remember that guest we had, Doug, a long time ago? We had a live event for Stacking Benjamin's Crystal. And we had a guest named Michael Santos. And Michael 
Michael was a cocaine dealer. But if you remember, Doug, Michael thought, by the way, first of all, he thought that when he watched Scarface, that that looked really cool. He's the only oh guy goodness. I've ever met who got the wrong message from Scarface. Like, that <laughs> looks cool. That's me. If I could change somebody up in an apartment <laughs> to a shower rod and use a chainsaw. No, actually, well, he thought that as long as he didn't touch the Coke, that he was fine. Remember that, wow. Doug? Yeah. He, yeah. Link- he thought that as long as he doesn't touch it. What? So here's what you do, Crystal. This is what you do. You just put it in the lease agreement. I'm not touching the meth. <laughs> so, hey, copper. It's legal. Put right in there. Cops, I'm not involved in the illegal operation that happens <laughs> in our place, Jeez. even though I'm getting 20%. I'm sure that would cover you. Well, what state no. is that? The meth lab capital? Just make sure that might be in your lease. No meth labs. Because <laughs> there is a state that's known for those indiana and for anybody by the way who thinks that i'm not being sarcastic please i'm yes <laughs> kidding <laughs> oh, joe said we should take profits off the meth lab no way yeah i will no. link to that michael santosa <laughs> oh he's not on a show he was at one of your events yeah, yeah. stacking benjamins you yeah. can find it actually that live event you can find it on our youtube page. Oh, okay perfect yes. i'll link to that people can get wrongfully evicted let's pivot to oh, yeah bay management groups blog and crystal if you can link to this people can see it but wrongful eviction lots of reasons and you want to study you know one of my favorite favorite books is Sun Tzu, The Art of War. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite passages in that book is The Best Battles, The One That's Never Fought. Second favorite is Define Your Battlefield. So decide what battlefield you're going to play on. Like and to do that, Crystal, you got to know what the, quote, enemy is thinking. So knowing why your tenant might sue you, I think, is a great thing to know. So common types of wrongful evictions. Usually it's a wrongful eviction. Uh, If it's a retaliatory eviction, for some reason your landlord just doesn't like you. It can't be an emotional thing, Crystal. Just because we don't like Doug doesn't mean we can (laughs) kick him out of the truck. Number two, not following state eviction procedures, which should light a light bulb, Crystal. Your state Mm. probably has an eviction procedure. Oh, yeah. I know that personally, I've almost sued a landlord. This was years ago. I actually went to the Illinois Tenant Association and they legally got me out of my lease. But even for tenants, too, if there's something that deems the property uninhabitable and that'll be on your lease, you can get out of your lease if it's not inhabitable, but you still have to pay rent in escrow and the landlord won't get the money till they fix whatever you need fixed. But you can't just not pay rent because you are living in a place. They're giving you what you need, a place to stay. So you have to pay your rent in escrow. And then once they fix it, the escrow court will release the money to the landlord. But that's another thing to look out for, for tenants. Taking possession of your rental property Oh, yeah. Increasing your rent when it's not in the lease or decreasing a provided service like dropping a utility that was agreed on is something that potentially is called landlord retaliation and a tenant can sue. So you then have the ability to take action then. We will link to these. Remember, by the way, and this is also something, a lot of these costs you can try to put in your suit no matter which Mm -hmm. side you're on. You can also sue for legal fees. You can sue for court costs. You can sue for damages up to three times actual damages or three times monthly rent. Punitive damages, depending on your state regulations, return of the entire security deposit. You can sue for jail time in oh, wow. some states. I think that might get a little over the top <laughs> unless Doug is being particularly wow. unruly. So definitely keep on top of these things because there are things your tenants can do, but there are things as a landlord that you cannot do, like the changing of the locks. You're not allowed to just arbitrarily change locks. So make sure you know things you can and cannot do as a landlord because you can get in trouble and you get sued. And we want this to be as easy as possible. And getting sued is not fun. So know the laws in your state. But wait, I can sue for jail time. So if I'm a little short on money for the month and I just need some room and board. Oh, just sue I can get myself into. <laughs> Fantastic. God, I knew I would. I'm just that. not going to pay my rent for a month. I dare you to sue me. I dare you. There. Yeah. Coming up next. 
Michael McQueen is a researcher, a motivational speaker. His books have been on the bestseller charts around the world. He's from Australia. He has been touring the United States uh, recently. And he is a guy who knows how to, in a negotiation, how to get people unstuck. We're seeing in this political climate, mm -hmm. Crystal, people say, no, this is what I believe. And the more you show them evidence, <laughs> right, that maybe the other side of that argument might be a better spot. People yeah. dig in. People don't mm -hmm. change their mind. How do you get somebody to change their mind? How do you get a contractor to change their mind? How do you get a tenant to change their mind? How do you get a city official to change their mind? Michael McQueen is going to help us with that. But first, Doug, I think you've got a pop quiz. Sure do, Joe and Crystal. Hey there, Dieters. I'm Ruth's wrench-wielding repair guru, neighbor Doug. And today is an important date in history because on today's date, way back in 1642, a year or two before Ruth was born, ow, Ruth, it was a joke. God, I hate it when she break checks me. I'll rephrase. Way before Ruth was born, on today's date in 1642, I said way before. Dutch navigator Abel Tasman spotted the South Island of what modern day country, believing later that he'd found the west coast of a hypothetical southern continent. Almost like the time Ruth thought the city dump was an art sculpture garden. Kidding again, Ruth, kidding, I'm kidding. I'll be back right after I readjust the tire repair kit back here. Hi, this is real estate maximalist Alan Corey with today's House Money Media real estate tip of the day. The most likely reason a real estate deal goes sour is if you're forced to change your lending terms. This is only caused by adjustable rate mortgages or ARMS that typically have a one, three, or five year balloon. This means in the future, that balloon will pop and you'll be forced to refinance. These loan products are gambling without a safety net. Because what happens in three years when that adjustable rate mortgage balloon comes due and you've lost your job? Well, you don't qualify for a refinance anymore, and then you're forced to sell. Now, another scenario, what if interest rates skyrocket in five years to 15%? Well, you have to refinance at a much higher rate when that five-year balloon comes due. And now your property is potentially cash flow negative, a big no-no investing. So what's the best way to avoid this scenario? It's with 30-year fixed mortgages. You never have to worry about lending terms again unless you want to, and you want to refinance on your own timing. You also get to choose to sell whenever you want. You always control your asset and your investment when you use 30-year mortgages. You don't when you have adjustable rate mortgages. And that's today's House Money Media real estate tip of the day. If you're craving more real estate education, then head over to housemoneymedia.com to check out my real estate coaching and courses. Use coupon code DEEDS for 10% off all of our products so you can learn everything you need to know about long-term and short-term rentals, whether you're investing locally or out of state. That is DEEDS, D-E-E-D-S, for 10% off for all Stacking Deed listeners only at House Money media.com. Hey there, Dieters. I'm Texarkana's favorite back backseat driver, Roots mechanic, neighbor, Doug. More background on today's trivia question. On today's date in history, way back in 1642, Dutch navigator Abel Tasman spotted the South Island of what modern country? It was New Zealand. More facts from this totally true story. Tasman nearly didn't recognize it because everything was upside down. Then he waved, it was New Zealand, so let's just say he waved sheepishly to the undoubtedly excited, <laughs> right, see what I did there? To the undoubtedly excited people he'd just discovered. They were so happy to finally be discovered. And now, here to help us get unmind stuck, a guy who's living his whole life upside down over there in Australia, it's Michael McQueen. Crystal, check this out. How do we always find our guests walking down the streets of Texarkana? 
Ruth, pull over. My favorite pastime is picking up. It's Michael you know, McQueen. Random. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Michael. Come on in, man. How Let are you? Let me scoot you? over. Let me move. Let me scoot, scoot, scoot. Hello, you two. Lovely to um, finally connect in person. This is yes. great. I am so happy you're here with us, especially, you know, in America, Michael, we have an election year coming up, and it mm -hmm. reminds me every year that we're all very mind stuck. So <laughs> perfect time for us to talk to you. Let's frame this, Michael, the way that you do at the beginning of this project, because I think it's such a great way to introduce this topic of us being mind stuck. And maybe in the grossest way possible, by the way, you meet a woman... <laughs> at your son's daycare and she has this interesting profession can you tell us about her yeah so she works for one of the water utilities and what they're doing is actually rolling out the idea of recycled or purified drinking water that comes from wastewater so that's a nice way to put it you know that what we flush down the toilet and down our sinks gets purified and then comes back into the drinking water. So as you can imagine, and even like just, I mean, looking at your responses there, there's a sense of disgust. Like, do I really feel comfortable with this? The thing is, this has been happening in multiple parts of the world for years, and it's proven to be super effective, super safe, all the rest of it, very pure, but trying to get people on board and shift their thinking, change their minds about this has been a bit of a challenge. So there's a well, couple of case studies I give. Yeah. Even before we get there, she asks you if you want to try some. Uh -huh. Like Absolutely what was going not. through your head, Michael? Well, I mean, obviously you're with someone who you respect and they respect you. So you want to obviously be brave and be <laughs> courageous. So I thought, I'll give it a go. So I tried it. And I think too, you have to in that moment suspend the notion that this is actually recycled wastewater. It comes in a clear bottle Yikes. with a cap, just like you'd get in a shop and you know the science means that it's just as pure as anything. It's probably more pure than the stuff we buy in a store. But even still, you've got to sort of overcome that deeply seated sense of disgust, that instinct within you. And that's been the hardest thing for regulators to try and address around the world in multiple areas over the last few decades about this whole issue. But a lot of this, Michael... I introduced the concept that this is a great way to frame the mm. argument. A lot of it you suggest is the framing. Yeah. How were municipalities able to start getting around this, that this is clean drinking water? And frankly, with all the water problems we have around the world, we're going to need to do this more and yeah, more. Yeah, that's it. So, I mean, one of the things they've done is they've actually made it really clear that this is already happening. And this is one of the things often when we have this resistance to new ideas, it's because they feel so new, so unfamiliar. And the uncertainty is the very thing that makes us go, I don't know this, I don't feel safe, so I'm going to dig my heels in, even though probably the logic makes sense. If it doesn't feel familiar and safe, I'll just re you know, reject it outright. So what they did is they made it really clear that most people living on river systems where their water system is being fed by a river, you are already drinking recycled water. I mean, that's just the way it works. So the adage in the industry is, get this, water goes through seven sets of kidneys from the point where it falls as rain to when it's evaporated again. And um, Crystal's face oh, wow. speaks volumes yeah. right now. And so just that sense of people going, <laughs> okay, wait, so this is not a super new thing, firstly. What they also did is some really fun stuff. They seven developed kidneys. a range of beer, like a beer arranged craft brewed beer that was made using recycled water and it was like it was great beer it won all these awards so just reframed this as something that again mm. felt familiar felt accessible it wasn't weird and that's half the game is really getting around that sense of people have that fear of things that are unfamiliar or that make them feel like there's a lack of certainty associated with whatever you're suggesting to them i think people would be okay if that were the explanation of that's how dasani tastes <laughs> <laughs> and it's probably potentially true. Well, and it's funny because, you know, you build the case, Michael, that this is a problem that's been getting worse and worse. I mean, I remember in the USA during the George W. Bush election, the campaign manager did a great job there of telling people that the other candidate, Al Gore, was a, quote, flip-flopper. Yeah. It wasn't that he changed his mind about something or had his mind corrected. Like, more and more, it feels like we come up with an idea in our head of what we think is right, and then instead of changing our mind, Michael, we dig in. Why do we dig in our heels so much? Yeah, well, there's often, well, there's a couple of reasons. If you're in public office, for instance, you see this play out where it's sort of paradoxical that we'll say to our leaders, we want you to be real and authentic and vulnerable, and then when they do... We crucify them. And so this has got to go both ways. Like as as a populace, we need to cut our leaders some slack and actually give them a bit of grace. And so when they actually change their minds and do what we want them to do, which is to be honest and just be a thinking human who's willing to be open to different perspectives, that we allow them to do that. But if you look at what actually stops people being willing to do this, regardless whether you're in leadership or not, one of the dynamics I discussed is this idea of psychological sunk cost. 
And most of us are familiar with economic sunk cost, that idea that I've invested so much of my money, so much of my time already in this particular course of action or this particular decision, I'll stick by it, even though a better option has emerged and even though I'm actually disadvantaging myself. Now, that dogged determination kicks in. The same things happen psychologically. When we've had a certain mindset or a belief that we've invested a lot of ourselves in and we've become an advocate for our reputation is now tied to this. Our ego is wrapped up in this. It can be really tricky to walk away from that or walk it back, even if a better idea has emerged. And even if you know there's something that we go, actually deep down, I really should change my mind, but we often feel ego bound. And so that's half the challenge in changing someone else's mind is creating a safe environment where they feel they can change their mind without having to admit they're an idiot. And yet, sadly, that's sort of the dynamic we so often set up for people. I want to ask in a moment how we do that. But before we get to that, I'm wondering, as you're talking just about how decisions get made, because, you know, we say, Michael, I'm going to sleep on it, right? Crystal, I think mm. I'm going to sleep on that. I'm going to, you know, Ruth's taking us around looking at properties and we go, I'm going to sleep on it. And yet you write that we make opinions very quickly, like very, very yeah. quickly. We make an opinion. And then what happens? Like, how does that all work? Yeah. And understanding this is really important because we've had this assumption really probably four centuries now that humans are fundamentally reasonable and rational. That if you just give people enough reliable evidence and data, they'll eventually come to their senses and you know, see the light and change their minds. That's not, of course, how it works. In fact, the opposite dynamic plays out. So when someone's got a very fixed or rigid view, the more evidence you expose them to, the more they double down, the more they lock their mindset in rather than opening their mind. And so if you look at what actually happens in our brains, and we often use this term you know, of two minds about a decision, and we use that term to describe being indecisive, but there's actually some real truth in it. So there's actually two very different minds that we're in at any moment. As you're engaging with someone else, be it in a personal context, in your family, or in a work context professionally, you've got to realize which mind you're actually trying to change. Because the first mind that we tend to be in a we assume we're in all the time is our inquiry mind that lives at the front of our brains. It's the logical, rational bit. And we'd like to think we use that rational, logical mind for most of our big decisions. The truth is we use it for five to 10% of our thinking and values formation. So where does the rest of our thinking happen? In a part of our brain I refer to as the instinctive mind. And that's that limbic system part of our brain, fight and flight processes emotion. It's very impulsive, very reactive. And so how to speak to the instinctive mind is a very different story to the inquiry mind. And yet most of us, when we're trying to sell an idea, we give all the logic and evidence and data and the pie charts. And we wonder why it's not working because we're appealing to the wrong mind. Well, the two minds you did, and you gave a lot of examples of that, of even how ad agencies come into play with those two different kinds of minds. So how are we talking to, like when we want to get someone to see our point of view, which one of those two should we play to? Yeah, and it's important because you sort of need to play to both, but it's the sequence which matters. So you want to speak to the instinctive mind first because people typically retrofit logic. They make a decision and not even necessarily emotional decision. Sometimes it's an intuitive decision, that idea, I've got my gut feel it, this is the right thing to do. A lot of that thinking happens in our instinctive mind. And then what we want to do is we want to overlay logic to justify the decision we've already made. And so the key is if you want to really, I guess, sell someone on an idea or a product or a project, you've got to appeal to the instinctive mind first and then give them the logical reasons afterwards that essentially seal the cognitive deal. You know, they make people go, you know what, I have fully decided now. But the other way around, if you appeal to the inquiry mind first and give all the logic and evidence, it's almost like you disengage the really gutsy part of the way our brain works. You disengage that instinctive mind and people start getting all analytical and often don't engage emotionally at all or even wholeheartedly and therefore really never get to a firm decision. And so you've got to start with the instinctive mind and then move to the inquiry mind second. Am I getting this right, Michael, too, that it might help to talk to somebody over a cup of coffee, like if I want to change their mind, a cup of coffee, the science of coffee might help make my case. Yes, that's interesting. Caffeine actually makes us more gullible when we drink it. <laughs> and it actually makes us more persuasive when the other person we're speaking to is drinking it. So next time you're sitting down with someone and you say, you know, let's grab a coffee and they drink the coffee. Okay, and you don't, or vice versa, be mindful. Like, if I'll just have a water and you can have coffee. Bear in mind, there might be a play that's playing out here because you know, caffeine <laughs> does make us more open. It actually, it's almost like it wow. sets the defences down of our instinctive mind. But there are a whole lot of other things that play into this too. In fact, one of the bits of research are fascinating in this book was looking at how our brains build trust because trust is the essential first ingredient for influence. Until we trust someone, 
our instinctive mind is up. Like the guardrails are up, we're skeptical, we're cynical, we're looking for holes in their argument, and we're not willing to actually listen. And so if you look at what builds trust, and a guy named Paul Zak, who's a neuroeconomist based at Claremont University, he suggests that the key in this is you've got to essentially match the vibe of the person you're engaging with. And so that can be sometimes, and you've probably heard the advice like I have, you know, match the person's body language. And if they cross their legs, you cross your legs. If they scratch their ear, you scratch your ear. And it's, it's a, I remember the old, it's like yeah. the old neuro-linguistic Correct. programming All kind of, of that. stuff. Yeah. And yeah. I always find it just a little bit, I don't know, a bit icky, a bit contrived. I'm like, how do you actually do that in a natural way? So I was chatting with Paul recently and he said, one of the things they've discovered is that actually, mm. if you go for a walk with someone, walking side by side, eventually your cadence, your pace will match theirs. You get in sync. And if you look at what happens when we physically synchronize with someone else, where we're walking beside them, we're doing something alongside them, our brains essentially create a connection. There's this, a deeply unconscious sense and it releases what they call oxytocin, which is our body's social bonding hormone. And when that gets released, that's when we're far more open and willing to consider and listen because that's where trust is built. What if somebody has, you know, you go over some of the ways we mm. make decisions and one of them is using our intuition, yeah. right? And Michael, I've been in more than one discussion where somebody goes, oh, my gut says I shouldn't do yep. this. Like, how do I fight against this gut feeling? And what's going on in our brain when our gut tells us something? Yeah. Well, the first thing you want to do is not diminish that because you know, we can all think at times in our lives where we didn't go with our gut instinct and paid a heavy price because our intuition is really, really powerful. And if you look at, I don't want to get into the neuroscience too much because it's a bit, it can be a bit boring, right? But if you look at the instinctive mind, it's not just in our brains. And that's a really important distinction because our instinctive mind is taking cues from our bodies, from our gut, from our heart. In fact, the heart and the gut both have an intrinsic nervous system that essentially has neurons similar to the way our brain does. And so we often hear at the brain-gut connection, that idea of, you know, your gut is picking up on stuff that is so deeply unconscious, your brain's not aware of it, and it's informing the ideas you're having. And so sometimes when you go against your gut, it's a dangerous thing because your gut's telling you something you need to listen to. And so people have that sense of my gut's not sure on this. You need to firstly give them permission to go, listen to that. That's actually really important. And sometimes just allowing them to feel that's a valid thing is what they need. Give them space and time. And it might be a case of, and we talked about this before, just sleeping on it. If people feel rushed, like they haven't arrived at a decision themselves yet, they're feeling like they're being coerced into doing something, even if it's the right decision. And eventually they'll get there on their own. You need to let them get there on their own. And so I think that's one of the things you can't push people too quickly or negate that gut feeling. And in some cases, get them to tease it out, to talk about, you know, what's that feeling like for you? Or what are some of the concerns you might have? Or even what were some of the maybe the expectations you had that this doesn't feel like it's meeting? Because what's interesting is when people start speaking that stuff out, they realize that they actually didn't have any expectations or maybe their expectations are wildly off. I mean, you think about this with price. When someone says it costs too much, and like, fair enough, it may be sort of out of your budget. What sort of price point were you expecting? Just out of curiosity. And when they start speaking it out, even they themselves go, gosh, that's a really ridiculous price. Of course it was never going to cost that. But I never realized I had an unrealistic expectation until I got a chance to say it out loud. And so asking questions draws people out, gives them that safe space. And it's got to be a safe space. You can't be asking questions to catch people out. Or it can't be that sense of I'm using a play on you. I'm trying to manipulate you. It's got to be a genuinely curious, open question and then giving mm. them space to think out loud. Some of those are the best ways to diffuse that reflex of fear that may be a valid gut reaction or may just be that you just feel uncertain and you need a bit of time to talk it out. I love that too, what Michael's saying, Crystal, because so often I feel like if we just are able to clarify our messaging and just talk more on a deeper level with people. I mean, I remember when Dr. Seth was talking about building communities with us you know, dealing with people in communities, like getting to know people on a little bit deeper level, like your gut might be to not trust yeah. you. And that could be a hundred percent right because we just don't know each other well enough yet. Yeah. And your gut also is where so many prejudices live. You know, so many of our unspoken prejudices that aren't serving us well and aren't serving the community well. And one of the great things is the more you get to know people and there's that sense of real honest openness like prejudice or bigotry never stands the test of intimacy. When you get to know someone, like really know them, it's amazing how all of those superficial reasons you have for not liking someone or not trusting someone start to fall apart. So sometimes this is tricky. Knowing when and when not to listen to our intuition is really hard. It requires a lot of discernment. And this is where you're like, you need to get to know yourself. What are the times where you need to listen to your body and when shouldn't you? Like in one of my tells I've discovered over the years is whenever like my hackles go up, like the back of my neck, I can feel my hair go up and I get that hot feeling. I've just learned to stop. 
don't say what I'm about to say. Like for me, that's one of those deeply unconscious, whether it's emotional or spiritual or physical, whatever it is, it's that somatic knowledge. I just know that I'm about to say something that I could fully defend and justify, but for whatever reason, it's not the right thing to say at the right time because the right thing said at the wrong time is the wrong thing. And so I've just learned over the years to trust that intuition. <laughs> and I mean, hopefully I get it right most of the time. Sometimes I just still barge on in and say it and, like, and well, then regret it afterwards. In. And we all have those moments. Yeah, you cannot eat your words back. But this also uh -huh. goes back to like, because even not even as far as a prejudice, it's like a price prejudice where you're like, you know, mm. you're trying to scam me or something like that. And yeah. it seems like what you're saying is like, the more talking you do, the more features you list, be like, hey, what about this price? And I'm giving you, you know, and you're spelling A through Z, what part about this price is A through Z not worth it for you? Or you don't see the value yep. in all these things. So that does make sense yep. that asking these additional questions or just having a dialogue or even listing all the features of the why seems like it's just as important. Yeah. Yes, yeah, certainly. And I mean, that can be part of the solution, but it's also, you know, if you're in the position of, for one of the better words, selling, and we're all selling, we're selling ideas and values and viewpoints and products and services all the time. So, but if you're in that position of you're the salesperson for whatever this perspective or idea is, the best thing you can do is approach that with a posture of openness vulnerability, self-deprecation. Like when I speak to financial advisors, for instance, I mean, most times when they're sitting down with a new client, what's going through that client's right. mind? How do you and What's in it for you? Like, this mm -hmm. actually, what do you mm -hmm. win from this? That's a big one. Correct. And so the best thing to start with when you're sitting down with someone and go, hey, so you're probably wondering like how this all works. Like where do I get paid commission? What sort of commissions? And you might say, I don't really need to tell them that because it's on all the terms and conditions. Hey, firstly, no one reads them. Yep. Secondly, this is an opportunity for you to be trustworthy and open and vulnerable. So the way this works is I get paid commissions on blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, my goal, and the only reason this works is if you're happy and you tell other people, that's how my business works. This is a word of mouth game. And so like it just even being upfront and calling that out sets their mind at ease. It starts to address some of those intuitive fears. And interesting, some of the research I looked at in the book was um, this guy named Kip Williams, who's a social psychologist. And he did research looking at when juries in court cases started to favor one side's argument over another. And what he found is that typically what happened is one attorney came to the table essentially with, you know, really honestly, in a self-disclosing, self-deprecating way, information, evidence, details. So they worked against their own case. It's like, well, okay, you're going to probably figure this out. So I'm just going to tell you, these are the things that we're sure about. Here's the stuff we're not sure about. And what's interesting in that very moment, what it did, and this is the key word, it disarmed the other party. So instead of that jury sitting there uh, and trying to look for all the holes, look for the arguments, but you being yeah. up front saying, hey, this might not even be the right thing for you or whatever it is, like just being self-deprecating is very disarming, but it also communicates to the other party that you are fair-minded, open, honest, trustworthy. And I think the more we can lead with that posture rather than trying to put this well-crafted, well-curated facade together and have every argument in our favour, if people only hear one side of a case, they're always naturally thinking, what's the other side you're not telling me? So, hey, just bring it up, be up front with them. And so these are simple things we can do that essentially allow the other person to feel safe with us. Now, this can't be manipulative. It's got to be honest. Like You've got to be real about this stuff. It can't be like the script that you roll out to win trust, you know, because that's the antithesis of what we're talking about here. But just be real with people. And this can be just as effective if you're dealing with a teenager at home as the parent. You don't have to be right or perfect, or like all together all the time. When you stuff up, admit it, say sorry, acknowledge your weaknesses. This is one of the most powerful things we can do if we're going to build the sort of trust required for influence. I think on two fronts, Michael, those super help us when we're speaking to homeowners that maybe might want to sell their house, they might not want to sell their house. Also building a team of contractors to work with. I think that helps. There's another negotiation we do where people are often mind stuck. And I mentioned we have an election year coming, Yeah. but like Crystal's in the middle of a development right now. Often we have to talk to city officials. We have to talk to area officials. There are two areas where you write that people really dig in and it's around identity, right? We get very mm -hmm. tribal about our politics and ideology. No, this thing that you want to do, Crystal, doesn't jive with who I'm telling the world I am as a politician. Yeah. How yep. do I uncouple what I'm arguing from either ideology or identity when it comes to dealing with elected officials? Well, firstly, identity is such a deeply seated thing. And so trying to work against that is tricky. What you want to do is frame your idea or your perspective, your project in a way that is congruent or allows that person to feel that it is congruent with who they are and what they're about. Now, that is sometimes tricky, but essentially you want to make it seem relevant to who they are. Because if you're trying to fight against someone's deeply seated sense of their identity, 
that's going to take a lot bigger process, particularly when they're in a public sort of role. Um, and so Jonathan Haid has done some great research on this, looking at what he calls the five moral foundations. So essentially, what are the five ways that we form our value sets and our identity? And if you can frame an idea in terms of one of those core values or those moral foundations, the person's going to be far more open to what it is you're suggesting. So that's the first one. But I think also what you need to really do is realize that people aren't afraid of change. And yeah, this goes right. against so much of what we've been told for years, that people are just inherently afraid of change. If you look at the most recent years of, from a neuroscience perspective, that's not actually the case. What people are afraid of is loss. And so what are people most afraid of? If they're afraid by considering what you're suggesting, by changing the way they do things or changing their mind, they might lose. And the three big ones, certainty, power, and dignity. And the moment people feel that what you're suggesting to them will come at the cost of one of those three things, that's when they dig their heels in, even if they think deep down what you're suggesting is a good idea. And so rather than trying to sell the upsides of change, we'd be better to lessen the loss, try and show how this is not going to mean a loss of dignity or power or certainty. That's where the game is won or lost in that exact moment. I love that idea, Michael, because reading like uh, Sun Tzu, The Art of War, you know, the best battle is the one that's never fought is one of my favorite lines yeah. from that book. And if you think through this identity and ideology that you might be fighting against, you can eliminate those before you even walk in the room. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. And one of the things I'd encourage people to do, and this might seem counterintuitive, is rather than upselling your ideas, unsell them. It just truly like, say, you know, hey, this might not be for you. This might not be even the best idea or the right time. And like, mm -hmm. I completely get it. And by almost taking it away from the person, and you probably notice this over the time, and you take it away from them, the posture flips. And it's like if you're talking to someone and you walk toward them, what's their huh. instinct to walk backwards? And yet there's just something about like by you taking it away from someone, you're essentially giving them the opportunity to opt in and feel like they are in the driver's seat. And I find this even from my work, like as a speaker, like my work is conferences any day of the week, somewhere in the world, I'm speaking at conferences. Yeah. When clients will ring up to book me to speak at a conference, there are times when I'll know it's not the right fit. Like I'm not the right speaker or it's not the right industry. I can think of someone to be a better fit for you. And I'll tell you, not nine times out of 10, when I say to the client who's rung up to inquire, you know what? Thanks for thinking of me. I actually don't know if I'm the right fit for you. I can think of someone who'd be better. The whole conversation flips and it's like, they start to sell you on like, no, 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 like we really think we've done our research. We actually think you'd be, and like, it's, and it's nice. just me being honest and like being transparent. But it's funny how, like when that call started, they were expecting me to sell myself mm. and why I'd be a great fit. Like just shifting the posture changes the whole tone of the conversation. We barely touched on, Michael, I got 87 more questions, but you know what? If people want to go deeper, you just wrote a book on this topic called Mind Stuck, Mastering the Art of Changing Minds. And I think mm. it's available everywhere. Yeah. It is. It's available everywhere. And there's details online at mindstuck.net as well. But yeah, it's a lot more in there we haven't gotten to. But yeah, I mean, that's the challenge. This is, this is a big issue and it's an important issue, particularly politically and socially. And we are so divided. And it's such a shame because that tears at some of the foundations of not just democracy, but the way our communities work. Like, how do we get better at disagreeing without being disagreeable? And that's a big part of my vision for this book as well. Well, what I found very impressive and that I love, Michael, was just getting behind how, and as you've already detailed in just a few examples today, how many of our assumptions are just so wrong and we yeah. go at it. Like the idea that we're rational and behavioral economists now proving, nope, we are the furthest thing from yeah. rational. In fact, yeah. actually one more thing, and I don't remember what this was, but you did point out, you know, everybody here has a picture of Warren Buffett on their wall somewhere, right? Being uh -huh. money geeks. Yep. What you said Warren Buffett only displays one of his diplomas, I think. Yeah, it was his <laughs> diploma for doing the Dale Carnegie persuasive communication course decades ago. And he would say to young people that he was mentoring or working with, if you can just figure out how to influence others effectively huh. and with integrity, your professional value jumps by a huge proportion because it's one of the most important skills. I mean, we spend, so the headline data is we spend 40% of our days trying to shift or influence the decisions and the thinking of others. And yet we're actually not very good at it. And that's really the goal of this book is to hopefully fill that gap, give people some tools to be able to do this far more effectively. That brings up a good point too. Like yep. my mortgage broker, when he told me how much he made based on what my down payment was, he probably made the most off of me that one year that he said yeah. that. Because if he had he said that earlier, yeah, you know, absolutely. it's For like, sure. hey, I want to help you because you're helping me. Yeah. So, yeah, it's like that makes a difference. Michael, thanks a bunch. We're going to drop you off here at the Sonic, if you don't mind. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thanks so much for the ride. And thank you for the conversation. I hope that was helpful. Definitely. Thanks again to Michael McQueen. You know, so important. I think the first thing in any argument, and this is kind of assumed by Michael's entire 
discussion, Crystal, is having some yeah. empathy and exploring where the other person is. Like how often have you been in a conversation, you're like, oh, I didn't even realize where the other person on the other side of this discussion was, like where they're coming from. Yeah, and from. like I said, he said, match the vibe. So you're matching the vibe of the person that you're negotiating with. And I like that he said the self, what is it? How do you say that? Self- Deprecating. Self-deprecating humor. That usually, like, that, um... <laughs> Self-depreciating. Self-depreciating. Humor. Yes. The self... I think that's a new tax law. Self- I would love to depreciate yeah. myself. Yeah. Your accountant goes, what are those lines? Oh, I'm depreciating myself. But that humor, it usually, like, it breaks the ice, too. And it, you know, it brings you down and it opens a level of vulnerable. Gosh, vulnerability. You are that, struggling. That's needed, you know, but that level is needed, like, for a negotiation. Because you do, you're friends, you know, you're getting on the same vibe. You're coming up to the same cadence. He did mention that, too, when you're walking with someone for so long. So you're matching their vibe, and they're like, okay, I'm connecting with her. She'll be a good person to do business with. She's not trying to screw me over. Let's do this. And then understanding that you're fighting against somebody's ideology. Yep. You're maybe fighting against their identity and decoupling whatever you are doing from that. Again, knowing what battlefield, to use my Sun Tzu language, to know what battlefield <laughs> if I'm fighting this battle on, I can avoid it by going, okay, I'm going to shift this away from this being an ideological argument. This has nothing to do with your politics, Mr. Right. Alderman. This is something over Helping, here instead. Yeah. Like benefits decoupling yep. that yes because he said Super. you have the two minds inquiring mind and the instinctive mind and the acquiring is like the logical number two obviously is the emotion and five percent is really the logic so you really need to you know you speak to number two five. first so you want to it is even ads they speak to emotion first oh because even earlier before we started talking we had extra time so i was showing them my advent calendar i love advent calendars i have one from trader joe's one from target i usually buy the one from whole foods too but they had this energy like that stuff that i (laughs) i just love did anybody else just notice that crystal became 11 years old yes just like all of a sudden crystal goes from a mature real estate investor to oh, yeah. an 11 year Most old. of us get ours from the liquor store, Crystal, <laughs> but you get yours from Trader Joe's. All excited. I love it. This, this stuff is fun, but you're using more adjectives and, you know, so you're appealing to the emotions of, hey, this is good, the benefits, you know, of, you're not saying, hey, you know, I want this at cost. You're more selling some benefits of, hey, we're going to keep working together. You're going to make more money. This is where you're going with your negotiations and unstucking their mind. Like you're in it for the long game here. I just know now, Doug, <laughs> if we want to unstuck Crystal, just bring over that yes. big calendar. One with good chocolate like, work. Uh, what else? <laughs> it's the middle of May and I bring an advent calendar so. over. <laughs> Crystal, that's just a bag of Snickers. I know, but I'm counting them down. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Twix. Make it Twix. Hey, let's take a call. Hey, hello to Ruth's rotary phone right there. We just got a text message from Chester. Chester has a reverse mortgage question. My elderly neighbor passed away. How do I find out who holds their reverse mortgage and how do I establish contact to buy their property? Crystal, that's a great question. It Chester, is. what yeah, do you Yeah, thanks. So even so, the first part of the question is how do you find out who holds a mortgage? You can even look this up for any property. Of Even if, if I want to know how much Joe owes on his home, I can look that up. Every state or county is different because I know in Chicago, you go to the CCRD, the Cook County recorder of deeds you can go to that website type in an address or you may need the property pin number but they'll let you know what all the mortgages are on a house and what lender holds it you can also use this to even look for negotiating because you can see how much someone owes on the property for negotiation too so that is the first step is to go to your local find out who records the deeds because when you get a mortgage it is recorded So unless they paid cash and there is no mortgage, but he knows that it was a reverse mortgage, then that's how you would go about that first part. What's exciting here too, in the second half of this question, Crystal, about establishing rapport and figuring out who to talk to, it is important here to do that fast, but to also do it very respectfully, Mm -hmm. you know, 
she or he was a great neighbor, love being around them. You know, I'm also a real estate investor and I could make this really easy for the family. Keep it out of court. Out of, I don't know if it still has to go through probate or not, but yeah, you would be helping them out a lot. And even you can offer, be like, hey, I've been cutting the grass. You know, I know the person passed away. I've been cutting the grass, you know, just to make sure you guys don't get tickets or doing like little maintenance, raking the leaves. I know they don't get snow, but you know, you can, you know, talk them up about all the things you've been doing around the property, you know, to keep it manicured and taking care of it. And even if you have neighbors that are alive too, offer and you want to, you know, break the ice on potentially buying, offer to do something nice for them too. Like, you know, bring in the trash bins or, you know, I saw it was windy today, you know, so I, I moved X, Y, Z. So definitely do that with respect and, you know, be nice about it. Cause you know, there was a time where people they backed into the wrong garage and then the person started shooting. So make sure they're nice, warm and approachable people, too. And I think that's the first place to go if you don't know the rest of the family. Look at the obituary. Most often people, a family will post an obituary and will say they're survived by this person, this person, this person. Yeah. And then it's just a matter True. of Sherlock Holmes searching for their address, their contact information, and then respectfully uh, saying, hey, you know what? I can help you avoid realtor fees. I can make oh, yeah. you a good offer on this house. At the very least, I'd love to be considered, have an opportunity. If you're going to sell considered. the property, I'd love to be considered. Or even, yeah, and if the funeral hasn't happened yet, you can send flowers. They may send a thank you note. So that's another thing. I'd too. avoid saying flowers something at the food. funeral. I'd avoid the eulogy. Right. Like, see, yeah, get up there. Don't be like, hey. <laughs> okay, but anyone want to Does speak? anybody yes? have some? thoughts about Edna they'd like to say oh I do yes uh, Edna lives in a great house it's a fantastic place it's a a three bedroom two bathroom I I probably list it for 289 uh don't don't go there yeah thanks for that question Chester Crystal people got questions for us how do they ring Ruth's rotary yes I like that ring. It had a nice ring to it. So head to stackingdeeds.net slash voicemail and even slide in my DMs. So I've known Chester for a while. So he just sent me a random question. And sometimes I don't check my messages. So this is like a couple weeks ago that he sent the message. But yeah, any way you feel comfortable communicating, you can tell us we want to hear your voices or you can message any one of us. Coming up next week, we are going to put a bow on this year with a roundtable episode featuring a couple of fantastic recurring guests. Our friend Paula Pant from Afford Anything, who owns a bunch of rental properties and has a great real estate course every year. And Mindy Jensen from Bigger Pockets Money yes. going to join us for what should we have learned through the real estate events of 2023. And Crystal, as you know, there have been one or two events oh, yeah, that might ones. be... It might be Teaching important lessons. to learn, yeah, learn something from. If people want the show notes one more time, where do they get it? Head to stackingdeeds.net slash show notes. They're written by me, so you will get a good recap. And I'm going to put the Friday, in case you haven't seen that movie, I'll put a link to where to watch that and all the other fun stuff we talk about in the show notes. Dieters. Here at the end of the show, we need your help. A couple things. Number one is if you know somebody who's a real estate investor who needs some positive reinforcement in their corner, please tell us to your friend. And another way to get the word out is when people leave us reviews, often the algorithms out there will, for a short time, will show us to more random people looking for real estate help. So please review the show if you can. But then also, finally, we are also looking for trusted partners for the podcast. If you know a business that a lot of real estate investors, real estate professionals use or should use, or you're affiliated with one, contact us. Joe at stackybenjamins.com is me, Crystal. Oh, yeah. I'm at Condo Crystal in the internet streets. Yes. Either one of us. Write to us and say, hey, I think I have a fit. And we could talk about maybe having you be a sponsor of the Stacking Deeds podcast. Yeah. Okay. Or reach out to neighbor they Doug any, at yeah, junk in my the trunk. trunk. Junk in my trunk at gmail.com. They can't trust what I'm going to say back. <laughs> I just think it's pretty funny that Doug demands that he get included in that after he said we should get a cut off the meth deal. I just want to bring, <laughs> just, <laughs> just want to bring that advice. up. Yeah. Speaking of Doug, Doug, what's on your to-do list after we finish today's episode?
Well, Joe, first, think to yourself, what's going on with my tenant that might lead to a lawsuit? Let's diffuse that situation right now. Second, engaged in a difficult negotiation or discussion where you can't get your contractor or a city official to agree to your point of view? Try beginning with their emotional brain and working from there. But the big lesson? When you discover people who haven't yet been discovered, remember to do it with empathy. While everyone wants to be discovered, they may not be as excited as you that you're taking their land and quote, upgrading it, promising to film some cool fantasy movie there. Thanks to Michael McQueen for joining us today. You can find out more about their work at michaelmcqueen.net. You'll find his new project, Mind Stuck, wherever books are sold. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingdeeds.net. Israel is 5,690 miles away from the U.S., 11 hours by plane. Hate travels faster. In a comment, in a post, in a second. Jewish hate is up 388% in the U.S., Black hate, Muslim hate, and Asian hate are up too. When one hate rises, they all do. Let's stand up to all hate together. Share and wear the blue square from StandUpToJewishHate.org.